I'm Myron Posniak. I'm from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I've been there for about 30 years. Um, we're going to talk about the basics of abdominal Doppler. We'll review basic waveforms. We'll talk a little bit about uh, hepatic veins, portal vein, hepatic artery, and uh, the other major vessels. And we'll finish with a discussion of Doppler artifacts and how they could create trouble for you uh, in the abdominal scan. Why bother doing abdominal Doppler? Well, when we do an ultrasound exam, we have anatomic information, but with just the push of a button, we can get a little bit smarter. We can capture hemodynamic information. That is, how blood enters an organ, how the pressure waves interact, and it just decreases my diagnostic uncertainty when I'm dictating a report. If I see an anatomically normal organ and I see normal flow profiles in the arteries and the veins, that reinforces normality. But even in the presence of a normal appearing organ, occasionally blood flow can be distorted. So what is it? What am I looking for in Doppler? Is it uh, velocities? Is it waveforms? Well, a little bit of both. But I'll tell you, the, if, if you're just looking at velocities, you're going to miss things. Waveforms are very rich in information. And if you only hang your diagnosis on a velocity, you can make mistakes because there are plenty of artifacts that can introduce mistakes into velocity measurements. John Jewell, who used to be the chairman of radiology at, at Wisconsin, has, has a great uh, saying, and it says, a radiologist with a ruler is dangerous. So, uh, Really, I like to look at waveforms more than I like to measure velocities. Now, there are factors, there are conditions which will alter uh, hemodynamics and change velocities. Um, velocities, indeed, will help us to identify these conditions like stenosis or arteriovenous fistulas, um, hypervascular lesions, tumors which pull in blood flow will increase arterial inflow velocities. Uh, compressive masses, be it a tumor adjacent to a vein or you know even the pressure of your transducer, it will pressurize tissues and it may increase uh, velocities. Sometimes tumors release vasoactive amines. These are substances that can either constrict arteries or open up the capillary bed uh, and again change flow dynamics. And finally vasospasm. Um, with uh, certain conditions the arteries can just spasm down, changing uh, flow into uh, an organ. But there are other conditions that affect velocities that really aren't a manifestation of the disease process you may be uh, trying to diagnose. Uh, cardiac output. Now, how well is this person's heart pumping? If it's a weak heart, then the waveform is going to be altered, and that's really got nothing to do with the organ that you're looking at, it's just a function of the waveform that's arriving at that organ, is disordered. Uh, blood pressure changes can affect waveforms. Medications, is the patient on any pressors? Um, the state of hydration, is the person dehydrated or are they overhydrated? That will have a great impact on venous waveforms. Uh, whether or not the patient has been fasting is critically important in looking at the splanchnic vasculature, the superior mesenteric artery, the IMA, uh, the, the velocities of portal vein will change. And then if you have a patient who's older, their vessels are not as compliant. All of these uh, factors will affect waveforms and velocities in uh, an end organ, but really are not a manifestation of a disease process in that organ itself. Well, on top of that, if that wasn't enough, there are technical factors that can affect flow measurements. Uh, you have to angle correct. If you forget, you may critically underestimate a velocity. Uh, incination at angles of greater than 60 degrees uh, is guaranteed to introduce error into velocity measurements. The closer you get to uh, 90 degrees, the worse off you are. Angle correction is difficult with tortuous vessels. Uh, when you have arteries that twist and turn, uh, it is difficult to identify exactly how to put that angle correction. And just a few degrees of angle correction as you get towards that 60, 70, 80 degree uh, angle, they can 
really significantly alter uh, velocity estimates. Where you put your sample volume in a vessel, especially a big vessel, that too will affect velocity measurements because of laminar flow. I'll show you that in a minute. And then finally, transducer pressure can change resistance to flow. If you push hard with your transducer, you will change the dynamics of flow within the underlying tissues. So here's a portal vein tracing, and if you look at the one on the left, if you look closely, you realize nobody angle corrected here. And the velocity, as measured by putting your sample volume here, at the, the cursor at the highest point, it measures 0.11 roughly meters per second. By changing the angle, by putting a little angle correction here, then all of a sudden we've more than doubled the velocity that we are measuring. Nothing's changed here. All we've done is uh, added the angle correction, and that then allows us to truly measure the direction of uh, the velocity of flow within that vessel, because the computer without velocity uh, correction automatically assumes that the flow uh, you're measuring is directly towards or away from the transducer. Transducer orientation relative to the course of the vessel is important. Again, the closer to parallel with the, clo with the course of the vessel you can come, the more accurate you're going to be. So if you're going to be measuring the left renal artery velocity and you come from the anterior abdominal wall at this point, your velocities are going to be terrible because you are imaging perpendicular to the vessel. You really don't want to be coming from there. You want to be coming from the back. You want to come down the barrel of the vessel. Now, if you have a skinny patient, theoretically, you can come from in front, but you want to come from the contralateral side and aim down the barrel of the vessel. All right, this is a renal transplant, and I am imaging this person with gentle pressure with the transducer. Basically, no pressure. Here's the arterial waveform. I'm on a interlobar artery, and the resistive index I'm getting is 0.65 meters, 0.65%. Uh, so, I'm sorry, 65% or 0.65. So, that's normal. That's what we expect. So, what I then did is I took that transducer and I pushed. I pushed firmly. I wasn't causing this patient discomfort, but hard enough to basically blanch these tissues. And if you look at the arterial waveform, look at the difference. And the only change here is the fact that I applied pressure with the transducer. I basically squeezed diastolic flow way down to the point where resistive index here at end diastole is 100%. So just be careful if you're going to be doing a carotid artery and you're going to heal in with the transducer to get a better angle, just don't pinch the underlying artery because it's like pinching a garden hose. You're going to create a jet of high velocity flow. You're going to change the dynamics within the vessel. All right, in any tube in which you have flow, the highest velocities are in the center. The slower velocities are along the wall, and it simply has to do with drag. As the RBCs are bouncing along the wall, they are dragging. They're moving slowly. Here's a RMI phantom in which we've pulsed it, and you can see the curve of the velocity as it surges forward. It forms, it, the, the form is a parabola. And so, again, the highest velocities in the center, the slower velocities along the wall. And in CT, there's a similar phenomenon you can see when you uh, add contrast. So here a patient had a contrast injection from the superior vena cava. The contrast came down and kind of flowed through the right atrium into the inferior vena cava. And then as the flow surged back up, it stuck. The RBCs with the contrast in them stuck along the wall. And that's just because they haven't been flushed yet. That's a nice CT equivalent of what laminar flow can do to you. So uh, here's a, a B flow of a jugular vein. And you can see as this person's cardiac activity stops and the flow surges forward uh, during the, the, uh, the uh, well, with the A wave, it pushes back. But uh, with the S and, and uh, D wave, it'll surge forward, and you can see that parabolic uh, waveform. There's another trick you can use, and that's using a velocity tag. On a lot of these systems, they're pretty robust, and you can uh, do this little trick of tagging a specific velocity a different color. So here I use the green tag, and I put it at the velocities that are in the lower range. 
that are going towards the transducer. And so on this image of the portal vein, you can see the lower velocities are, are clinging to the wall and then a little lower velocity in, in the branch vessel. And so if you change it and you put the green tag on the higher velocities, guess what? It's in the center. It's picking off the, the higher velocity lamina in the center of the vessel. I got really fancy with this image. So um, this is flow going uh, away from, let's see, yeah, it's coming towards the transducer. And so the deep blue hues, those are the, that's the slowest flow. And you can see right up against the wall. Then we come into a little lighter hue. Then we've got the green tag here. Then the light blue, a little more central. And now we're even aliasing to the other, to the pink color and then and then deeper hues so you can see how many lamina this this image is projecting for you this system you know this is not a new uh, scanner this is a pretty vintage scanner and yet the technology is very robust it can image every single pixel and accurately detect the frequency shift and and lay it out there for you so when you have a vessel like this and you can see these nice lamina of flow there's no way that there's any turbulence within this vessel. That's, that's nice to see that. All right, we did the same thing with the uh, portal vein here. We put the green tag in kind of the mid-range, then, then an alias to the center. And note, you got a nice uh, uh, uniform flow here with the sample volume in the middle of the vessel. So here with the sample volume in the center of the vessel, here with the sample volume to the edge, you have two different appearing waveforms. This one is nice and clean because it's picking up only the low velocities, I'm sorry, the high velocities in the center of the vessel, whereas here I'm picking up the lower velocities that are bumping along the wall. In effect, if this was an artery, then you would, you would think consider that there was filling in of the systolic window. So anytime you put your sample volume in a vessel, try to get it into the center, into the middle of the vessel, to avoid this. Here I just got rid of the green tag on these images so you can see better where that sample volume is and how it affects the waveform. Okay, center volume, uh, sample volume small versus sample volume wide. Look at the difference in the tracing, how more of the slow velocity pixels are picked up because we're sampling across the spectrum of lamina across the vessels. You wouldn't want to have your sample volume open this wide when you're trying to characterize the waveform within any one vessel. This is a useful tool uh, when you're searching for a tiny vessel. Let's say you've got a hepatic artery and a pediatric liver transplant that you're trying to find and you're having difficulty. That's when you want to open up your sample volume and search, sweep a wide area of the image to try and find that artery. But if you're going to try to characterize the flow within it, sample volume small. Okay. So I mentioned this earlier. Arterial waveform is influenced by cardiac function, the aortic valve, the integrity of the arterial system. That's more for the systolic side. And then downstream resistance influences the diastolic component of that waveform. So here are two tracings. This one is in the celiac artery and this one's in the SMA. Same patient, same time. Look at the difference in these waveforms. This is a relatively low resistance waveform. This is a high resistance waveform. There's very little diastolic flow. Why the difference? It's, it's a function of what these two blood vessels are perfusing. The celiac artery is perfusing the spleen, the liver, a little bit of the stomach, all right? These are solid organs. They basically function all the time. They are taking all the blood that they can get. The gut, on the other hand, it changes its perfusion demand based on whether or not you've eaten. So a fasting gut really doesn't need a lot of flow. And so the body is smart. It will clamp down the arterioles within the gut and allow the blood to shunt to other part of the parts of the body where it will do more good. If you gave this patient a meal, this will change from a high resistance to a low resistance waveform. Okay, here's a brachial artery. Okay, and this arm is at rest. And we have 
fairly high resistance, 91% resistance, very little flow at end diastole, because this artery is primarily supplying the muscles of the forearm, and these muscles aren't doing anything. So again, the blood shunts away from them. So I gave this uh, volunteer a, a towel, I rolled it up, and I put it in their arm, and in their hand, and I said, here, pump this, pump this up. It's like uh, when you're going to get an IV started, you, you tell the patient, pump up, here, pump a fist, make a fist. And you know what you're doing? You're making them work. And so the muscles of that arm now have a higher uh, demand for oxygen. They need to get waste products out. And so the arterial bed will open up and increase flow. And so what happens to that flow? It becomes low resistance. The velocities pick up and there is much more diastolic flow. So just in the few minutes that it took for this person to pump up, do a little work with that arm, we went from a 91% resistance to a 62% resistance. Um, these, are, these are conditions you have to keep in mind as you're doing Doppler. Not only what artery, what vessel am I looking at, but what is the condition of the underlying organ? Is it, is it working hard or is it, is it at rest? So lots of factors affect velocities. But let's spend a little time now looking at waveforms. Uh, we'll start with the hepatic veins. There are three, the right, middle, and the left. Well, that's what the books say, but in reality, there's always accessory veins. There's an extra right or an, or an accessory left. Uh, there are caudate veins. These are unique. These are small direct branches that go directly into the inferior vena cava. But the main vessels converge on the IVC uh, about a centimeter below the right atrium. So they're very close to the right atrium and with its associated uh, periodicity. So the margins of the hepatic veins are relatively anechoic. That's a nice way to tell them apart compared to the portal vein, and their course is relatively straight. The portal vein is more echogenic because it has part of Glisson's capsule that dives in along, and there's usually a little fat uh, in the portal triad as it goes into the liver. So again, the, port the hepatic veins tend to run a more straight course. So here you go, three hepatic veins converging, but like I said, most often you'll see uh, a few accessory veins. And then in about 5% of patients, uh, you'll see this vein. This is an accessory right hepatic vein. It's typically down three or four centimeters from the convergence of the uh, main hepatic veins and usually supplies the right lobe of the liver. If you have a patient who's got a, uh, a little bit of steatosis, then you can see these little guys here. These are caudate veins. These veins punch directly into the inferior vena cava. They don't drain via the main hepatic veins, and this is why the liver behaves differently with cirrhosis. Uh, the uh, main hepatic veins will get shrink-wrapped as the cirrhotic fibrotic process clamps down on them. It, uh, it resists their outflow. It, it, it chokes them. Uh, but it's harder to do that with the tiny caudate veins, and so the central part of the liver tends to function a little better, and it will actually hypertrophy, and this is why. So here's the caudate lobe, and in a patient with uh, severe end-stage liver disease, that part of the liver typically uh, becomes enlarged. All right, so we're going to talk about the waveforms. Here is a classic hepatic vein waveform, and to simplify it, it's two steps forward, one step back. So what, what does all that mean? Well, first of all, let me, let me just tell you about one thing. I like to use the term periodicity when I talk about the velocity variations in the hepatic vein. I don't like pulsatility. When you take somebody's pulse, what do you put your finger on? You put it on the artery. So pulsatility for arteries, periodicities for velocity variation in the veins, and then phasicity I reserve for changes in velocities due to respiration differences. Okay, So these little bumps on the hepatic veins, these velocity variations, have labels to them. It's the A, C, S, V, D. All right, what does all this mean? What's it all for? Let's, let's take a little time and, and digest this hepatic vein tracing. So here I've got an EKG tracing, electrocardiogram. Here's a tricuspid MMO tracing, and here's our Doppler tracing. In the EKG, the P wave is, occurs during, uh, it triggers right atrial contraction. So it forces the right atrium to push blood across the tricuspid valve, therefore that valve will, will uh, 
increase in its uh, aperture. It opens up a little bit, and it shoves that blood into the right ventricle to give it a little kick to push blood forward into the lungs. But since there is no valve between the right atrium and the inferior vena cava, then a small component of blood will spit back, actually reverse direction, and go back down the uh, inferior vena cava and into the liver. The okay, same thing will happen above the heart. It'll go backwards up into the, uh, the great vessels of the neck and arms. Okay, so now the atrium is finishing its contraction and the velocity starts to flow forward again. It'll start filling the empty chamber. But before it gets very far, we get to the QRS complex on the EKG. That causes the right ventricle to contract. Now that's a much more powerful muscle than the atrium. And so it will slam the tricuspid valve closed, and it'll actually push back on that annulus that's holding the valve. And when it pushes back, it will push back against that atrium and against the flow which is starting to surge in and cause a little hiccup. It slows it down just briefly, and that is the C wave. And I remember it as C for closure of the tricuspid valve. Okay, so now we've got this empty right atrium and flow just surges forward very briskly, accelerates, accelerates, until you get to a point where finally it's starting to saturate and the velocities slow down. So this change from accelerating to decelerating uh, velocity of anti-grade flow is known as the S wave. And it's S because it occurs during ventricular systole. So the ventricle is contracted at that point. The atrium is open and relaxed, but its velocity starts to slow down to the point where it, it actually may spit backwards a little bit if it overfills, but in most people it'll just, it, it may come to a complete stagnant point or just slow down significantly. All right, so now what happens? Now we're at the point where the ventricle is going to relax, and as it does so, the tricuspid valve pops open. And when it does, now there's this empty chamber in front of this column of blood, and so velocities start to increase again as they surge forward into the empty right ventricle. So this change from decelerating to accelerating flow is known as the V wave, and I remember it as valve opening. All right. So now you've got an empty atrium, well, an emptying atrium and a uh, empty ventricle, blood surges forward again until again it saturates and starts to slow down. This is known as the D wave because it's occurring during ventricular diastole. Okay, And where are we again? Now we've come back to the P wave and we're starting all over. So pretty complex waveform, but you know, easily understood if you understand the electrophysiology and, and the function of the tricuspid valve. Uh, so that, that waveform is key to see. Now, I'll tell you, you're not going to see the C wave very often at all. You've got to be very close to the right heart to see it. It dissipates very quickly, and you're only going to see it in a very small percentage of patients. Most of the waveforms you're going to see are like this. So again, two steps forward, one step back. You get a little further away from the heart, and that may not manifest as actual reversal, only as a slowing of flow. Uh, get further away, it starts to get damped out. Now, how far from the heart you see this waveform is totally a function of how well hydrated the patient is. If the patient is dry, then there's not much blood in the inferior vena cava. And therefore, if the vessel walls coapt, if they kiss, then that wave stops. It's not going to go any farther. It can't because there is no medium across which to transmit that flow. You need fluid. So uh, if you go further away from the heart, typically it's going to be a flattened waveform. But don't be surprised if you see that waveform down in the femoral veins of a patient who is vigorously hydrated. All right. So let's go to the other side of the liver, the porta hepatis. Uh, it gets about a liter and a half of blood per minute, about a quarter of cardiac output. Only one other organ system gets more, and that's the kidneys. They get about 30%. Two-thirds of this blood comes in the portal vein, and a third in the 
hepatic artery, but the hepatic artery brings all that oxygen. Normally you get a nice brisk upstroke in systole, and it's because it, you know the arterial system wide open, uh, that arterial surge in systole should just scream right into that, into that artery, and, and the velocity should accelerate very quickly. At end diastole, velocity should be about 0.2 meters per second. Systolic velocities may vary, usually 0.6 meters per second. At end diastole, about 0.2. This isn't absolute, but it's just a rough approximation. Resistive index, usually around 60 to 70 percent. Okay, so that's how we calculate the resistive index. It's the distance from peak to the trough versus peak to the baseline. And then, again, the end diastolic velocities, roughly 0.2 meters per second. The portal vein should have a relatively flat flow profile. Okay? A little bit of velocity variation, a little bit of periodicity is okay, but not too much. Okay? Why? Well, because the portal venous system is isolated from cardiac activity by the capillary plexus of the gut and the spleen on one side, on the inflow side, and the liver sinusoids on the other side, the outflow side. So this, this vascular system is isolated. Now, a little bit of periodicity is okay, and this is usually introduced by pressure variations within the liver as the hepatic arterial systolic pressure surges into the liver or maybe the uh, A wave from the hepatic veins. So they will influence the portal vein flow at velocities and, and cause subtle undulations. The velocity itself in the portal vein should be roughly around 0.2 meters per second in a fasting patient. So relatively close to diastolic flow. And this relationship of portal vein velocity to hepatic artery velocity is known as the liver vascular index. Okay? It's easy to get because these vessels are right next to each other. So you can do the wide uh, gulp, the, the uh, wide sample volume, and capture both in the same tracing. Or you can put uh, your sample volume in one vessel and then move it to the other one in the same uh, tracing. Portal venous flow, it basically percolates through the liver. The pressure gradient between the portal vein and the right atrium is not very much. All right? So normally flow, uh, pressures in the uh, portal venous system are about 0 to plus, plus 6 millimeters of mercury, whereas in the right atrium, minus 2 to plus 5 millimeters of mercury. That's just a few millimeters of mercury. So really, the portal venous blood just gently percolates through this liver as the liver processes it. So here's that tracing with the side-by-side uh, -side, uh, artery and vein, and you can see end diastolic very close to the portal vein velocity. This is a normal liver vascular index. Now, what about this tracing? Hepatic arterial velocities are up, portal venous velocities are down, and now there's a discrepancy between velocities at end diastole and the portal vein. This is an altered liver vascular index. What does this mean? It can mean anything. Now, early literature back in the 80s started talking about this being uh, particularly good at diagnosing uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Unfortunately, that's not true. This, uh, this effect occurs with all sorts of liver disease, be it hepatitis from any condition, any cause, uh, tumor in the liver, be it lymphoma or metastatic disease, um, it, it, anything can do this. It's really not very specific. And the other thing I don't like to talk about is it's not compensatory. The hepatic artery, it's being, bringing oxygen to the liver. It's, the, uh, it, it's fueling the engine of the liver. The liver is like a big factory. It's, it's doing a lot of work for the body. The portal vein is bringing blood into the liver to be processed. But if the liver is dysfunctional because of any of these conditions, then a portal vein, vein flow simply cannot enter the liver. Whereas the hepatic artery, however, it keeps pushing flow into the liver because it is fueling the disease process. So this concept is, is useful. You know, you may be doing an ultrasound and somebody has elevated liver function tests. and Everything looks pretty good, but you, do, you see this kind of a liver. 
And this what? This is the starry sky liver. You see the fatty portal triad standing out brightly against the background of the liver parenchyma. So does this mean that this is a hepatitis, that this is an inflamed edematous liver? You know, that's, that's what it might be. But, you know, we, you and I, we see these occasionally, and, and there's no liver enzyme elevation. There's no, you know, we might be doing it for a completely unrelated reason. And so what do we do with this? Do we, do we talk about it or do we ignore it? I would encourage you in a patient like this to get that liver vascular index. Because if it is altered, if the portal vein flow is down, the hepatic venous flow is up, there's something going on, and it deserves to be mentioned. And, you know, maybe this patient needs to see a hepatologist. Maybe they need a better history. Maybe we need to find out what's going on. As the liver disease worsens, the degree of flow slowing or reversal increases except in the presence of a paramilical vein. We'll get back to that later. So the liver disease will correlate with this. All right, let's look at some other vessels. Uh, the aorta, okay, ultrasound indications. Uh, an elderly smoker, we want to rule out aneurysm. Somebody with pain, we might want to rule out dissection. Somebody with a lot of pain, we want to rule out rupture or leak. Typically, that gets done with CT. So how do we image the aorta? Well, whatever window works. A lot of patients are gassy, so we may want to come in from the side. We want to push the bowel gas out of the way. If you're measuring diameters, you want to make sure you watch out for tortuosity and maybe do a little angle correction with your probe uh, when you're measuring diameters. But in a nice skinny patient, we'll see the aorta up uh, just below the diaphragm. Uh, we'll see the origin of the celiac and the SMA. We'll come down a little bit from there to the level of the renal arteries. We'll see their takeoff. That's that nice banana peel look. Come down a little lower, you get to the mid to distal aorta. Again, a little Doppler to show you where the branch vessels are. And then finally, you get to the iliac arteries, and you see flow within those. So that, that's nice. You do your transverse measurements. You measure for aneurysm. You get down to the iliacs. You measure those two. Again, just be careful because a tortuous vessel like this, if you're holding your transducer perpendicular to the torso of the patient and you're trying to measure this iliac artery, you're going to way over measure the diameter. Now, the Doppler flow dynamics in the aorta, very high resistance. Now, I'm talking about below the level of the renal arteries. So why is it such a high resistance? Well, what is this blood vessel supplying? It's primarily supplying the musculature of the lower extremities. And those muscles are at rest because the patient is just laying there in front of you, right? So again, that plexus does not need a lot of flow. Therefore, the arterioles will clamp down and you end up with a high resistance system. The celiac artery. Uh, lives right here. It's about a centimeter inferior to the diaphragm. It gives rise to the splenic artery, hepatic artery, the left gastric. Okay, and uh, it typically will have a fairly low resistance flow. Here's the celiac artery right there. Here's the SMA, another centimeter lower to it. It uh, supplies the mesentery of the gut and the right colon. Um, sometimes you can see a hepatic artery coming off the SMA. That's a replace that occurs in a small percentage of patients. And again, two very different arterial waveforms. The celiac artery will have a low resistance waveform, and the SMA will have a high resistance waveform. Kidneys. Have, there's the main renal artery. It divides into the segmental, subsequently the interlobar between the lobes. Okay. And then it, the arcuate artery arcs over the top of the medullary pyramids. And then the interlobular arteries. These are tiny little guys in between the glomeruli. With power Doppler, we can see them. We can see these little interlobular ar arteries out there in the periphery. The normal main renal artery flow should have about uh, 1.6 to 1.4 meter per second velocity. If you start getting over that, uh, if you're getting towards 2 meters, you might worry about stenosis. The resistive index should be relatively low, 56 to 70 percent. And the systolic acceleration time should be brisk, less than 0.07 seconds from the onset to the peak of systole. In the venous side, we should have relatively continuous flow. 
we may see a little respiratory phasicity. And you actually, very often, you'll see the cardiac periodicity, that ASVD waveform. Now, you can see that effect here, ASVD. It's subtle, but it's there. And the reason I'm seeing it, because there's a full column of fluid between this renal vein and the right atrium. Why? Well, there's 30% arresting cardiac output coming out of that renal vein. It's likely going to maintain that cava well distended with fluid. All right, let's uh, talk a little bit about Doppler artifacts and how they can give us trouble in the belly. We can divide them into color and spectral, and we can divide them into technical and physical. Te physical being just a function of the limitations of physics, technical being that we set the knobs incorrectly, and I'll let you guess which one happens more often. So let's talk about velocity range errors. And typically with that, we mean that the scale, the pulse repetition frequency, is either set too high and you lose information, or it's set too low, and you alias. So this, these settings are all about how fast the flow is in the vessel which you are investigating. So here's the portal vein, very simply seen. When I took the, sample, the pulse repetition frequency and set it to 60, it's too high. All right. I don't see any flow in here on color. Why? Because the flow is being suppressed. That image is suppressed. The color is being suppressed by the wall filter. So it see that little black area between the two directions. It's it, it blocks out the painting of color in an area, uh, and and so no flow is seen here. If we take the uh, PRF and change it to a lower scale, now we appropriately show the flow coming up into the liver towards the transducer. Take the scale even lower. Uh, this is inappropriately low for the velocity in this vessel, and now we're starting to see aliasing. Okay, so we're, we're picking off the you know, high color uh, going away from the transducer, but this is simply uh, oversaturating the system, and it's picking off the color going the other way. Okay. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I know that. I'm not going to make this mistake. But, you know, this, is, uh, this was one that I, I made a mistake on. This is a, you can see this is a nodular cirrhotic liver. This person was ready to go for their liver transplant. Now, this was many years ago. Uh, you can see it's an older system. But, uh, you know, I'm imaging this portal vein, and I don't see flow within it. Lots of hepatic arterial flow. And so... You know, I, I would hesitate sending this patient to surgery if the portal vein was thrombosed. So they ended up sending this patient over to the angiographers who squirted the portal vein and they showed it to be patent. So what my mistake was, I had the scale set too high. Here are two carotid artery tracings. On this side, what you see is aliasing. Okay, The scale is low. This blue in the center of the vessel does not mean that the blood flow is going in the opposite direction. No, this is aliasing. And I know it's aliasing because when I go from the different, between the different colors, I'm not acro going across this black wall filter. I'm wrapping around from the high, sat high color saturation of the, the higher velocities to the, the bright yellow. So we're going from, from turquoise to yellow. So that's when you know it's aliasing. Okay? Take your, take your uh, pulse repetition frequency up, and we get rid of the aliasing. But there's a little trade-off here. Take a look at the wall of these vessels. Look at this one versus this one. Okay, So when I have the pulse repetition frequency set low, I get a better appearance of the interface between the flowing blood and the vessel wall. Whereas if I set it higher, I'm losing some of these very low velocity pixels, and this looks more ragged. It's the same vessel. It looks more jagged because the very low flow that's bumping along the wall is being suppressed by the wall filter, and so the vessel wall itself looks more coarse. Now, the, the take home point is if you are doing a carotid artery ultrasound and you are trying to characterize the vessel integrity, you know, is there atheromatous disease? Let's live with the aliasing, and we will see a nicer interface between the flow in the vessel and the vessel wall. Leave it to, you know, remove the aliasing, but you're going to add a more coarse appearance to the vessel wall. 
In spectral Doppler aliasing, same thing. It's like you take some scissors, cut off the top of the tracing, and paste it from below. Change your baseline, change the uh, 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 scale, and, and you'll get rid of that artifact. All right. What happens when I take this gain and I turn it too high? What I get is spectral bandwidth broadening, mirror imaging in the tracing, or an indistinct velocity envelope. So here's a uh, tracing, and it's a, liver, uh, a kidney transplant. And what I've done here is take the gain and crank it up as I go across this tracing. And so when you start with a gain set appropriately, we have a nice systolic window, we have a very clean velocity envelope, and we have sort of a darker tracing. Turn the gain up a little bit, and the tracing becomes a little brighter. But look what's happening to the systolic window. It starts filling in, okay? And then it gets a little bit more whiskery here. It gets a little dirtier. So when you image, you, you want to see the tracing well, but just be careful. Don't overdo it because you can get into trouble. All right, here, this is a phantom. It's a block of gel, and all I'm doing is I'm moving my transducer back and forth across the block of gel. So everything here is moving at the same velocity. So here I hit one wall, I'm going to one side, and then I'm going to slow down. I hit the other wall, start going in the other direction, and so I'm creating this artifactual uh, tracing. Okay. This is just me moving the transducer across the gel, and I'm just doing it steadily. Gain, relatively low. I'm turning the gain up a little bit. The tracing is brighter, yes, but look at the systolic window. Well, let's call it the systolic window for the purpose of this discussion. It's filling in. Instead of being nice and open, now it's starting to fill in. Turn the gain up a little higher, filled in even more. Really bright tracing. But what's this? What are you starting to see here? Let's turn that gain up even more. Okay, systolic window is almost completely wiped out. And look at this. There's something that's going in the other direction, right? Wrong. There's nothing going in the other direction. This is just a block of gel, and I'm moving in this way. What's going on here? This is that mirror imaging in the tracing. Turn it up even a little higher, and you start seeing these spikes of noise. What is this? This is crosstalk. Okay, crosstalk, what does that mean? When you have these uh, tracings projecting either towards or away from the transducer, these are like two different channels on your stereo system. If you went and bought an expensive stereo, one of the things the uh, person selling it to you will talk about is channel separation. How good the stereo is at separating channel A from channel B, from the right from the left. And with good expensive systems, they're, they're very good at it. They keep this from happening. But in cheaper systems, you'll get this crosstalk. And so at higher volumes, the stereo doesn't sound so good. Well, the same thing happens with Doppler. If you have the gain cranked up too high, the signal talks across the channel and will bleed over to the other side and get projected artifactually. And then when you make it really powered up, you start getting these crackles. This is artifact. It is like on your stereo when it's really loud, it starts sounding very painful to the ear because it's, it's crackling. It's actually, the system is overwhelmed and it's sending out noise instead of sound. Now, there's one scenario in Doppler where that artifact, where that phenomenon is very useful, and that is in identifying gas bubbles in the portal vein when they are floating by. So if you have a patient with pneumatosis intestinalis and there's gas bubbles in the portal venous system, this is what you see on the tracing. So as a bubble goes by, it's not going by at a higher velocity than the rest of the RBCs. It's going along at the same velocity. However, your system is set to correctly paint the reflectors of the red blood cells. But when, a, when, a, when an air bubble comes by, it's a much, much more intense reflector. The sound coming back is much louder, and therefore a noise spike is painted on that tracing, and that's how you identify air bubbles. All right, so erroneously displayed flow reversal. I, I showed you two cases already, aliasing, 
or uh, the gain being too high. Uh, it's a, you can have just a poor system with lousy balance in the circuitry, or you can have it caused by grating lobes or side lobes. All right? Most of us, when we think of sound coming out of a transducer, we think of it sort of like a laser, but it's not. It's, there are lobes of sound. The sound is focused. And there are additional lobes that come off to the sides, the side lobe and the grating lobe. Now, I'll give you these are very weak, but nevertheless, these are still focused beams of sound, and they can interrogate things to the sides and make you, and maybe fool you, all right? So the side lobe right along the main beam, and then the grating lobes, these guys are way off to the side. These grating lobes artifacts are the worst on those very tightly curved intracavitary phased array probes. There's a block of gel, and I put a needle through the gel, like if you were doing a biopsy. When you guide a biopsy, you ever sometimes you see this thing that you think it's a needle, but it really doesn't make sense where it is, and then all of a sudden you pick up like, oh, whoa, here's the needle. Well, there's the needle. What's this? All right. This is an artifact. This is a grating lobe, a focus of ultrasound that comes out way off to the side, it interacts with the needle and then comes back to the transducer. Now, the transducer, when it, what, what, the ultrasound system, when it paints a reflector, it does not take into account these grating lobes or side lobes. It always projects on the image uh, according to if it was coming back from the main beam. So because this sound took longer to travel to the target and come back, the, the system, the ultrasound system, will paint a dot further down from where your actual interaction with the, with, with the needle is. So you, you have this artifactual needle appearing deeper than the true needle is. So, okay, that's it in, in grayscale. Does it happen in Doppler? And, and it does. Very subtle, but here this is a, a phantom. And flow is only going in one direction, so I should only be seeing it coming this way towards the transducer. But instead, I got this over here. What's this? This is a grating lobe that's coming across and interrogating the flow going away to the other side. Now you notice it's very weak on this tracing. I love this one. Okay, The sample volume is here. It's right in the middle of gel. There's nothing moving here. This is where the movement is. And so I, I had to it was a little tricky for me to do, but I was able to put the grating lobe right into that stream of flow, and here you get this tracing. So uh, does it happen clinically? It can. It's pretty rare. This is a renal transplant that had a very high resistance, and as I'm scanning it, all of a sudden, here's a sample volume right in the middle of the kidney, and yet I'm getting this very low resistance waveform. I have no clue where this is coming from. The grating lobe is coming out and interrogating some vessel somewhere, I don't know where, but you know, if you see this and it makes no sense, here's my advice. Don't take the picture, and then you don't have to explain to some surgeon what a grating lobe artifact is. Just, just don't take the picture. All right, bidirectional flow artifact. It happens when you image perpendicular to the vessel. So if you're just perpendicular to the vessel, you may get flow showing up on both sides. And I'll tell you, with these new ultrasound systems, that's hard to do. You really got to work at it because just a, a, a degree off from perpendicular, and these system will, systems will accurately paint the direction of flow. All right, if you, uh, if you do ultrasound long enough, you may see mirror image artifacts. So if you're near the diaphragm and you have a cyst in the liver, you can paint a cyst in the lung. Okay, here's a tips. What's this thing? All right, that's the diaphragm. This is not a catheter in the lung. This is simply mirror image artifact. Ultrasound hit here, reflected in this direction, came back, and so this projects deeper. Right? Are these accessory hepatic veins in the lung? No, it's simply mirror image artifact off the diaphragm. It's paint taking this and projecting it uh, deeper. Uh, Tracheal cartilage, same thing. There's nothing back here. The airway, that's where the air is. So everything deeper to that line is mirror image. And so you think there may be two sets of tracheal cartilage. No, that's not. That's artifact. All right, so if you have a blood vessel and the sound comes towards and 
comes back. That's where it should be, right? But if the sound hits the diaphragm, goes to that structure, interfaces with it, what the computer thinks is it came from over here, and therefore I'll paint a structure there for you. Okay? So, what blood vessel is this? This isn't a, that's just not a real blood vessel. Here's the hepatic vein. This is the inferior vena cava. The diaphragm is over here. And what's happening is sound came, hit that part of the diaphragm, bounced off of it, and then went right down the barrel of the inferior vena cava, got, got shifted, and shifted red because the flow is coming towards the transducer. The sound bounced back to the diaphragm, back to the transducer. This is artifact. Okay, anytime you're imaging anywhere near the lung, you can get into trouble. Okay, here's an interesting mirror image artifact. We're going to biopsy. Snap and out. Did you see the artifact? Look down here. Okay, there's the diaphragm. And just pay attention over here. When I was watching the resident do this biopsy, I got scared for one second. That's not, that's not the biopsy needle tip. It was fortunately there in our lesion. This is all just mirror imaging artifact. Color and nonvascular structures was written up a long time ago. And this is an important artifact. It is, it is a function of the motion discriminators in the systems. For every dot on the image, these ultrasound systems have to decide whether they're going to paint color or grayscale. And the discriminators basically decide for the intensity of reflection. If it's bright and the frequency shift is small, it's going to assume it's an artifact. It's going to assume either motion of the transducer in your hand or maybe the patient's breathing. But if it's a dark reflector, it, may, it will assume that this motion is real, such as a red blood cell moving in a vessel. And so what do you think of this? This is a gallbladder. Okay. Is there a cholecystic arterial fistula here. You know, it better not be. It's my gallbladder. The only thing I was doing here was taking the transducer and moving it in and out, pushing against everything. And so at a point in this image, everything was moving. And look where the system painted the color. It painted only where the low intensity reflectors are. So if you're taking an image of a cyst, and you're ready to hit the freeze button, and the patient blows their breath out, and just as you freeze it, the color paints into that cyst, don't take the picture. Again, you don't have to explain this artifact. Spectral bandwidth broadening is an artifact. It has to do with angle dependence and, again, a decreased angle. So if this is your direction of flow and you're coming in with your insinating beam in that direction, that's horrible. You're not going to have accurate uh, portrayal of the tracing. You're going to have bandwidth broadening. If you come in at that angle, not so good. Now we're getting better, now we're getting even better yet, and that is the best. This is where you're going to get your best Doppler velocity measurements, the best tracings. So here's a phantom, and the only thing I'm doing differently between this image and that one is we are electronically steering the beam. This is steeper, this is closer to 90 degrees, this is a little more shallow, so this one is better. Look at the differences in the tracing. I didn't change anything other than that. Look at the systolic window here. It's much better seen at a, at a shallower angle to the actual direction of flow. So imaging-wise, it's better, but also it's better for velocity measurements. Okay, so here we go. We've got a velocity measurement of 1 meter per second and 0.85 meters per second. The only thing different between the two is electronic steering. Now, this is a phantom, and in that phantom, I set the velocity at 0.8 meters per second. Which one measured more accurately? The ones that, the one that is less perpendicular to the direction of flow. The further towards perpendicular, the more inaccurate your velocity measurement is going to be. All right, let's talk about twinkle artifact a little bit. This is due to clock jitter from a irregular interface. Uh, typically stones, and crusted sutures, catheters, anything in the body that, that has an irregular interface. Now, it's very useful to confirm calculi, okay? You saw that bright structure, you turn on the color, and you get noise. And it's due to just a, an irregular surface, and so as the sound comes back, it's distorted. There's a pregnant female. Here's her left, uh, or her right ureter. 
See that little bright thing? What could that be? Turn on the color and boom, there is Twinkle Artifact. It's very impressive. It just nails that calculus. It's very useful. I was, uh, this was a neonate with biliary atresia. We were trying to find the gallbladder. I wasn't sure where the gallbladder was until I turned on my color and saw the twinkling of the, of the crystalline material in, within the gallbladder. There it was. Okay, Renal calculi. It's excellent at identifying renal calculi, but just be careful. This artifact, although it's, it, it'll, it will just make these stones shine at you, it overestimates their size. Do not measure stone size from here to here. You'll be, you'll be way overestimating the stone size. Okay, you should measure them off the image. So very often we'll see, you know, these are paraplegics. They come to us because they're, they're immobile and they're mobilizing their calcium. We rule out kidney stones. And, you know, we see these bright things. They they're, they're, uh, have twinkling on color. But also, the spectral tracing is abnormal. Sometimes maybe it's tiny and you think it's a blood vessel. Turn on your spectral Doppler. It won't sound anything like a normal arterial venous waveform. It actually sounds like you're tuning a shortwave radio. Here are two examples. And you can see how these, uh, these uh, uh, tracings have been altered. And when you listen to them, really, it sounds like you're tuning in a radio. All right, this woman had a bladder suspension procedure. She had UTIs often. And so the technologist is doing the scan, and she sees this thing in the middle of the bladder. She turns on her color, and there's flow here. And she says, Myron, there's some unusual blood vessel in the bladder. And I looked at that, and I go, oh, man, that can't be. Because this spectral tracing just makes no sense, right? This is artifact. And what this was, it was not a blood vessel. It was a suture material. From the bladder suspension, the suture had poked a suture through the center of the bladder, and the, uh, the strands became frayed. They got a little crystalline deposition, and so that's where that twinkle artifact was coming from. When you're looking at a gallbladder and you see this mass-like cluster, right, it could be tumor, but it could also be tumefactive sludge, right? Most of the time it's sludge. When you turn on your color, just be careful. This is not perfusion. This is twinkle artifact. Make sure you throw your sample volume on there to convince yourself this is just noise. This is not an arterial or a venous waveform. Okay, here's another patient's supine gallbladder image. Lots of color in here. This is not blood flow to a tumor. It's twinkle artifact. So in conclusion, Doppler, use it. Use it. Don't wait for somebody to order it. it you have to keep your skills up. All right. If somebody asks you to do Doppler because it's a very complicated case, it's not going to be easy to do. You want to learn and refine your Doppler skills on normal patients. If you have a few minutes between patients, play with it. Make sure you know it uh, and then apply these skills on the abnormal patients. Uh, some, Doppler, some, some disease conditions really can only be diagnosed by Doppler. Don't hesitate to turn it on. It can make you smarter. Here, here's a case. There's a, uh, uh, this very young uh, college student uh, was, uh, came to us because she had abdominal pain, and uh, we did this imaging study. Now, this was a long time ago, but uh, this was before I wrote the, the first Doppler book, and uh, the tech came by and showed me beautiful images of the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas. Everything looked absolutely normal. We were going to call this a normal study, but since I had a little time between the patients and I needed to capture some tracings for the book, I came in there and I started imaging her vasculature and I started taking some tracings. Normal aorta, normal portal vein, normal hepatic vein, hepatic artery. What do you think of that tracing? Is that a normal tracing? It's actually not. This is a tardis parvus waveform. Where's the systolic peak? It's flat and it's elongated, right? So from having a perfectly normal study, all of a sudden, we've got something going on here, okay? And then we, we looked at the celiac artery almost over two and a half meter per second velocity. What's going on here? This young woman had an arcuate ligament syndrome where the diaphragm was coming across the celiac artery and pinching it and causing decreased perfusion to the liver, making it relatively ischemic, and causing the pain. Here it is on the CT angio. You can see this defect. There's the celiac artery right here, and you can see how it's compressed at that point. So compression on the celiac artery, arcuate ligament syndrome, that's her diagnosis, and we would have completely walked past 
past it had I not stumbled into it with the ultrasound. Here, here's another patient, same thing. You can see the that jet. And it uh, it's kind of fun. You can see the, a difference between inspiration and expiration is that diaphragm slides across the celiac. It can make it worse. So uh, use your Doppler. You'd be surprised what you could see with it. Thank you very much. And if you liked what you saw in this lecture and you want to see some uh, more material, if you want to learn more about uh, uh, Doppler, uh, we've just published our third edition of the Clinical Doppler Ultrasound textbook. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, you can find it in bookstores. You can go to conferences. The vendors are selling it. Uh, hopefully, uh, you, you might learn a little more about Doppler. Thank you.